before we jump into the actual tools, I want to show you something here. I've got a copy of Visual Studio open, and you will notice that up here in the top right corner, I don't actually have my name and my picture. It's one of those things which I think it came out in Visual Studio 2013. And I thought, well, that's not very nice because now every single web, uh, well, not webinar, not just webinars, but you know, every single screencast that you do, you're gonna have your uh, name and your picture. And there is also, I think there's the smiley here. I don't know if it's only in preview versions of, uh, uh, Visual Studio or the release versions as well, but there, there is a smiley here as well. So I thought, well, how can I get rid of it? And I kind of Googled for uh, the uh, code to to get rid of it. That's that's you know exactly the uh, the project that I've got open right now. I'm not going to go into the actual project. That's not the whole. That's not the point of this webinar. But uh, essentially, uh, the one of the oldest ways in which you could actually extend Visual Studio is by uh, doing something called an add-in. So an add-in is essentially just a, well, it compiles into a div, into a library. And what happens then is, you know, after this library gets compiled, it actually gets uh, gets saved in a particular folder. So in the case of Visual Studio, let me see if I uh, get this correctly. It is in, uh, uh, if you go to documents and Visual Studio of whatever version you're using, there is an add-ins folder. And the funny thing about this is by default, you might not even have an add-ins folder here. So it's kind of unintuitive that you have to create the folder and then you put your add-in in here. So here's my add-in, uh, disable social features. There's just two files required. So one file or you know whatever, however many files you have for the binaries, I have just one deal here. And there is also a uh, an add-in file, which is just uh, a piece of metadata. We can actually uh, sort of, if I open up uh, Notepad here, we can actually take a look at what's inside. It's, it's not very exciting to be honest, because basically it tells you what version of Visual Studio you're targeting and it, um, it gives it a friendly name description. And then there is like an icon represented in this kind of binary encoded format, <laughs> which is a bit scary. But here you define the assembly and obviously the assembly has a, uh, you specify the class name and that class name gets loaded. It's, uh, it's a fairly straightforward process. And what I'm doing in this particular extension is I'm actually wiping out. Uh, so I'm, I'm physically going through the WPF uh, control tree inside Visual Studio, I am finding the right elements and I am hiding them. And incidentally, this this model, even though it's very convenient, Microsoft actually kind of killed it in Visual Studio 2015, which is very sad because it it's probably the simplest way to actually deploy something because it is effectively X copy deployment, meaning you just copy something over and that's pretty much it. Unfortunately, ever since then, uh, things have changed and we now have another uh, construct entirely, which in, in some cases is better. It's the uh, extensions and updates window. So uh, you, <laughs> you, if, you, if you're using the later versions of Visual Studio, there is no way that you can actually avoid seeing this because from time to time, everything uh, that can be updated will sort of pop up here. And you will also have updates to Visual Studio itself right inside the product updates, which I guess is one of the important parts, but there is also, you know, updates to the things which you, you might never even have given your consent for like Windows Phone SDK and, and it offers you to update that. So it's very convenient, but it kind of changed the model of deployment because now you have these Visual Studio extension packages, VSIX, and those are kind of like installers basically. So they're, they're a bit different to just X copying something over. But the great thing is we now have Visual Studio Gallery and Visual Studio Gallery has, uh, uh, essentially it's a catalog that Microsoft provides, uh, which lists just about every single extension, starting from the tiny little extension like my Disable Social Features extension and going off to you know the more complicated stuff. Everything can be hosted here. And in fact, uh, it, this is not restricted to VSIX packages. You can have a fully fledged MSI. In fact, you can uh, just provide the link because I mean the, the button for get now, you can just specify a URL to your own binary, your own installer. And that way you can uh, ship things very easily. 
So the benefits of this obviously is that you get automatic updates because now you, if, if you want to update something, you just update the metadata and there you go. It's kind of it finds it in the uh, in the Visual Studio Gallery. And I believe you can also add your own galleries, even though it's kind of, you know, it's similar to setting up your own uh, nugget store, you know, setting up your own gallery, but it is possible. And, and you get these listings and you get some manner of control in the sense that for some extensions you can, uh, not just uninstall them, but disable them and re-enable them later on. So this is very uh, convenient. And uh, this this kind of uh, changed the model uh, for uh, for deployment. Now, of course, the most popular extension out of all of these extensions is the Nugget extension. And you, you will see updates to the Nugget package manager, regardless of which version of Visual Studio you're using, well, the, the later versions, you're gonna see these updates like all the time because Microsoft, I mean, sometimes it's literally like updated every single day and Nugget itself is a package manager. So you're using a package manager to update the package manager, which is uh, a bit recursive, but Nugget is certainly the uh, most popular extension. And in fact, it's not just, um, uh, you know, Nugget has this this connotation that it's uh, uh, it's kind of uh, you know .NET oriented, but it's not really. I mean, Microsoft is trying to get Nugget to be kind of a package manager for all the languages, including uh, C++. And it, it is in fact possible. You can right click a C++ project and go into Manage Nugget Packages, and it will locate things for you. So, for example, I don't know if we try. Uh, something like reactive extension C++, for example, you can find it here. Now, there is a bit of a problem because like, if you're working with .NET, everything is straightforward. You download your library and it just works. Unfortunately, in the C++ land, you you download their library and there, there is very little chance of it actually working because the business might not match or because the compiler might not match. And certainly a uh, kind of uh, a well thought out library would actually package like a zillion different builds. This is in fact what happens, you know, in the real world. If you're building your own uh, library, you're going to be packaging it in, in you know, if, if, if in fact you are not just shipping the source. So there is no provision here to uh, ship the source and then have the source compiled on the uh, uh, on the client. There are other approaches to package management in the C++ land, like B code, for example, that's a fairly uh, recent development. But ultimately, yes, to some extent, the C++ uh, stuff does work with Nugget as well. And in addition, since we're talking about Nugget, I have to mention the fact that as a package manager, it's not the, not the Nugget uh, built-in manager is not the only solution. And in fact, since, since we're gonna, uh, since we, we make reshopper, we also uh, build this thing where if you write, uh, if you define like a type, for example, that doesn't exist, uh, like let's say I, I make a variable of some unknown type, and this, um, uh, this unfortunately at the moment is .NET only, but uh, one of the options we provide is to find this type on nugget.org, which is kind of convenient because then what we end up doing is we end up opening our own browser. So instead of using what, uh, using that extension for Visual Studio, we essentially have our own tool, which, uh, you know, you can also perform the searches. But in this case, look, uh, we typed in the name of a class and it literally went through every single every single uh, package in nugget.org, which is no small feat, let me assure you, because it's, it's you know, searching in this huge massive database. Now, of course, we index the thing. There is no other way for us to uh, really get it to, to work this quickly. But the end result for you is that, you know, you can just uh, click the button to install, press the install, and uh, it, it all, you know, sort of happens magically. Well, just, just the same as it would with uh, with the ordinary Nugget Manager, but the difference here is that the, the search is a bit more comprehensive. And so it kind of goes to show that ultimately you can just, you know, you don't have to use the built-in uh, functionality that Visual Studio provides. You can sort of write your own if you think that it's better. Well, it's, it's somewhat obvious in the case of Nugget because it actually exposes the uh, suitable APIs and whatnot. And uh, just in case you're wondering what some of the other uh, 
kind of popular extensions on on the gallery are well there are lots of web uh, extensions which are popular one which is kind of universal is the github extensions and in fact in visual studio 2015 they kind of uh, package it up together with the distribution of visual studio which is great by the way did you notice how i don't have a top menu like uh, to show the uh, menu i have to press the alt key here we go i press the alt key and it, it shows up and notice it's not all uppercase by the way <laughs> customize that as well but uh, this is also done with an extension believe it or not so uh let's uh, if we go back into uh, oh wait 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 yeah so uh the old way of doing things is the add-in manager that's something that lived up to and including Visual Studio 2013. I'm on 2013, so, so I can show this, but in 2015, it's kind of gone. So this is the, the trivial way of managing extensions. And then we have the, uh, the kind of nice, sophisticated auto update uh, way with extensions and updates. And so this tiny little behavior of only showing the top bar, uh, the actual menu when I press the key, that's actually uh, defined by a uh, plugin as well so essentially if i can just uh, let's see uh, it's something menu related and luckily enough we can actually kind of uh, perform a search here so here it is hide main menu so automatically hides the visual studio menu when not in use so uh, i guess it goes to show that you can have extensions which are massive and we're certainly going to talk about some of the like uh big uh, big extensions or you can you can have something that's just little tiny thing which just does does its own kind of uh, uh, does its own kind of uh, uh, thing and, and just just does this I, I don't know what the performance implications of this are because obviously for every plugin I assume that there is some sort of you know uh, additional process of loading up in in meth or whatever but uh, you can have these uh, tiny little changes and certainly most of the uh, extensions on the Visual Studio Gallery are in fact these tiny little things like for example my disable social features extension it just does about like three lines of code and uh, it, it, it sort of satisfies a particular need. So uh, I'm going to uh, mention both, uh, both C Sharp and C++ extensions because some of them are just in interesting ideas generally like for example one uh, one extension in the dotnet space which i've been using for a long time which is in a way funny is called ghost doc so let me uh, let me bring up the uh, oh, one second so it's made by uh, the submain company they also do code it right which is you know a, a code analysis thing uh, which uh, I, I don't actually uh, install anything for code analysis except for reshopper because then you get all sorts of collisions and, and crazy things. But they do this uh, product uh, called GhostDoc, which exists in a kind of free edition. So GhostDoc is interesting because it tries to infer comments based on the names of your, uh, your identifiers. So for example, like I have a function called create person. So I can press a shortcut here, control shift D, and notice what happens. So essentially, GhostDoc says, "Well, uh, you know, I think that a function called create person should create a person, and it, it writes creates the person, and it gives kind of default names to the uh, uh, to the parameters for the name and the age as well." Incidentally, uh, if you're interested in the C++ side of things, I certainly haven't seen anything like this. I haven't seen any extensions which actually kind of uh, fill in the blanks for you. What I have seen is an extension for, um, I think, a ghost doc. But there, the problem with that is that it also does all sorts, it, it doesn't do code completion, but it does its own highlighting. And unfortunately, VSharper kind of overlays all the highlighting, so showing it would be uh, absolutely pointless in this case because unfortunately we kind of uh, we clash with it and and that's one of the things you have to keep in mind when using the more serious extensions is that extensions can sometimes clash with one another especially the the major kind of code analysis and related extensions so you cannot just install everything in the kitchen sink because you're going to get conflicts you're going to get double menus and whatever and it's so it can get very messy. Okay, anyways, let me show you some of the kind of more uh, precision guided uh, extensions, uh, shall we say. So uh, the uh, 
extension, uh, well, I'll, let me show you two extensions which are kind of C++ related, although one of them is also applicable to .NET. Now, visualization, like for example, when you, you put a breakpoint and you, you run the debugger, the, uh, typically what happens is, uh, you know, if you've got an array of stuff, uh, then you just have, you know, you have your pointer value here and then you expand it and you have the actual values, which is not, not really that easy to view, unfortunately. So one of the extensions that I uh, use is called Array Plotter. So essentially, if we go into, I think it's a debug, uh, yeah, debug windows and then use Array Plotter, what, what you get, let me, move the window into the screen. So what you get is this kind of window um, and you can actually specify uh, which variable you want to plot. So let's say I want to plot the variable y and I have a hundred elements and it's of type double. And if I press the uh, plot button, I get the sign, which is exactly what I'm doing here. So I'm just uh, taking you know x values from minus two pi to two pi. I'm doing the sign of each and here is a uh, uh, the final result. Now, it's it's certainly not as powerful as MATLAB, and I think for for general data visualization, you you really want to use a computer algebra system, but where you want at least some indication of what your data actually contains, and a plugin like this is uh, really helpful in you know actually figuring out what's going on. And it seems to have uh, plenty of customization here. For example, instead of plotting scalar values, you can use uh, the uh, real or imaginary uh, values of a complex number and so on. So it's, uh, it does afford some customization uh, in addition to the, the kind of default behavior. So uh, once again, a tiny little convenient uh, thing. Another convenient thing, if I just go a few steps forward, let, let me get to return zero. So uh, let's say you're working with uh, uh, something like common, you've got your H results. I'm deliberately giving them integral uh, names here. What uh, another extension which I'm using is called the C++ debugger visualizer. So uh, the, the thing about debugger visualizers is that sometimes for a given uh, value, the, the kind of stuff that you get to see here is not just, you know, a blind array, for example, but it's something more sophisticated. So in the case of these H results, what I can do is I can move the mouse over and you'll notice that instead of those integral values, I get their actual defined. So one is defined as S false and uh, zero is defined as S okay. And if I do a more sophisticated H result, like for example, uh, one, two, three, then I move the mouse over and it actually gives me the error that, uh, that corresponds to this error code. So uh, in essence, this uh, this just, you know, another convenience options, and you can certainly make your own debugger visualizations. Once again, this is something that uh, Visual Studio supports and, and you can you can get these things to uh, sort of help you out in, uh, in the overall process, so to speak. Um, another thing that uh, I want to point out is if you look at the tabs here, you'll see that the CPP and the age got kind of fused into a single tab and I can sort of click here and move from one to another. This is actually uh, done via a commercial Visual Studio extension called Tab Studio. So this is, uh, well, essentially it lets you it lets you group things together. So for example, you, you can have your ASPX and ASPX.cs, you can have your header and your CPP file. Although personally, I would swap these two around. I would prefer to have the header file on the left, but unfortunately, uh, I don't think you can uh, customize this really. And it also kind of lays out the tabs in multiple lines. So a very interesting idea. And certainly if, you, if you're working with lots of files, and I, I often find myself opening far too many files, more files than I, uh, need maybe, then then it, it makes it reasonably convenient. And we can actually look at the uh, look at the options for Tab Studio. There is a, a bit of a cryptic regular expression here for how you actually want to group the uh, group the files together. But you can certainly use the examples, and and it will tell you if the uh, results are actually combinable. And there is a certain amount of uh, customization here. But essentially, it's a, it's a fairly straightforward extension. I think this is something that's really should be part of Visual Studio simply because it's a it's a very simple thing and you know the fact that it, it 
it's not it's not there by default. There's, I mean, we certainly provide navigation between CPP and header files. That's that's a given. But I mean, having this this kind of uh, visual control is just just an extra level of control, I guess, which is you know always welcome. I think. Okay, so so these are some of the uh, I guess smaller extensions, meaning that you know they they make a tiny change to your UI and that's it. So I want to. Uh, talk a bit more about the larger extensions. There aren't really that many. I mean, reshopper, which we make, is certainly one such extension. But apart from that, I, I can I can only count a few. So one of these extensions is, of course, Incredibuild, which is um, a cluster build solution. Uh, and I, I have to say, in advance, that this is a commercial thing, meaning you know, they. Uh, the company that makes it, they they charge fairly serious money for it, and they also charge it uh, kind of scale to the number of uh, CPUs that you're actually using. And the point of Incredibuild is distributed builds. So essentially, if you have several machines, or if you have I don't know, you have developers, or maybe even non-developers uh, using these machines uh, across your network, then why not use them to uh, compile your large projects? Now, it's not so much. Uh, it's not so much of a pain if you're working with .NET, because we are well somewhat lucky in the .NET space in that compilation is reasonably quick. But with C++, because each translation unit kind of tries to assemble the world, uh, this becomes uh, very relevant. So what Incredible actually does is uh, it basically uh, grabs whatever the uh, the kind of unit of work is in a sense. So whatever. Uh, you can compile in a single go, which in .NET uh, space, that would be a single project. So an entire project has to be compiled wholesale. Whereas with C++, it's a single CPP file. So what it does is it just distributes those things over a network and compiles them remotely and then kind of gets all the data back in, which which is very nice because basically your, uh, your performance improvement is uh, well, I wouldn't say limitless because it's still limited to you know you you can't have a bottleneck like uh, because you can't have dependencies between projects. But what Incredible does is it actually plans around those uh, dependencies and kind of optimizes the uh, the overall uh, compilation process, which which is great. The only catch here is well, first of all, you have to set up each of the machines which actually performs the compilation so that they have the appropriate environment, meaning they have the compiler and the libraries and the tools and everything. And certainly, uh, you know, in the C++ space, this is a bit uh, of a pain because you, like, let's say you have a dependency on boost, you really don't want uh, to be downloading boost every time you're building something. So you want to sort of pre-install it somewhere. And also different machines might have, uh, well, different machines might have different performance, but Incredibuild kind of tries to optimize for that, meaning that if it sees that a particular machine is just too slow in compiling something, it will also try to build it on another machine while uh, this this machine is building it. And, and whichever, you know, if, they, if the first machine turns out to be like significantly faster, like a lot faster, then it would use that and just forget the result of the other machine, which is great because it kind of you get a feeling for how your how your cluster of machines is actually uh, behaving. Uh, the another thing that I like about Incredibuild is that it is virtually zero configuration. So you install your coordinators and they kind of find one another. There is no fiddling with the firewall. There is no you know uh, antivirus issues. It just works basically. So for that reason alone, if you're uh, working with uh, large projects, I would say that incredible this uh, pretty much essential for the most part, although uh, it's uh, it's optimized to uh, well the the most common project types and scenarios, meaning that if you go a bit exotic, like if you do something like uh, mess about with the Intel C++ compiler, let's say as opposed to the Microsoft C++ compiler, then you might see certain issues and certain problems. And uh, certainly, their support is uh, very friendly and responsive. But uh, you know, there is there is actually an alternative. If you, if you don't want to pay uh, tons of money, there is something called Fast Build, and this is um, uh, this has been recently uh, popularized by Ubisoft Montreal. Ubisoft is a uh, 
uh, games development company, and essentially it's a free alternative. Now, the, the byproduct of having a free alternative is that you don't have to pay any money, but the setup of this uh, entire thing is a bit more complicated in the sense that instead of just grabbing your Visual Studio solution and kind of figuring out all the constituent parts, it requires something of a script for you to define how uh, the execution happens. And then, of course, you jump into the whole process of setting up uh, the uh, accounts on different machines for the distributed builds. You have to set up the firewall and, you know, those things which are typically handled by Incredibuild. But, uh, you know, if you do, let's say you kill a day setting this up and you only have to set it up once for a large project and then that's it. Uh, you are, you're good to go, essentially. So there, these are, you know, kind of the, the two options for uh, the, if, if you want uh, something come out faster. And it's especially relevant to C++, as I said, because with C++, and I know we're slowly getting to a state where we're gonna have modules. And when we do have modules in C++, things are gonna be much better, hopefully. I mean, no, I, I cannot say it's, it's a magic bullet because obviously it will take time to uh, take the standard libraries and move them to this this module paradigm, but at least the code that we write can be somehow refactored into this this uh, module paradigm, and so so it will be uh, yeah, in effect faster. And then the compilation model will most likely change because our current the current behavior of a single CPP file is that you know whatever includes it has, and obviously uh, you know the uh, the includes of those includes because you can see that each of the includes files also includes like the world basically. Uh, so all those includes have to be uh, put in here. And, and this, this essentially means that at the moment, yes, a single uh, translation unit is kind of self-contained. It contains the world, but the cost of having that containment is massive. And uh, this this essentially means that even though you can use incredible and similar tools to actually parallelize the whole thing and have it uh, do it in you know separate machines and separate threads, each of those threads is still going to be building a massive world around a single CPP file. Well, assuming that you have a lot in it, but typically, uh, you know, what happens is that you <laughs> you include everything that a particular file needs. So you include something like a vector or a string, and that includes uh, just you know a ton of stuff basically. And <laughs> that's uh, that's where the problem lies. So we'll, we'll see where modules gets us. But for now, distributed build paradigm is relevant, and it certainly works for .NET projects as well. Because well, you uh, it's it's actually a bit easier because in .NET, unlike in, unlike C++, the uh, dependencies are obvious. So the dependencies between projects, they're obvious. Whereas in C++, you, you literally have to like right click and then go into, uh, uh, you know, where is it? Uh, go, go and actually manually manage the dependencies of uh, a particular, so to build dependencies project dependencies. So you have to manually manage this, this thing. And uh, obviously if, if you have, uh, if you have uh, modules, then, then maybe this will go away eventually. I mean, I don't know how, because we still don't have this uh, idea of a, well, we, we do have a, an idea of a module now, but how it relates to an actual binary file that that, that is difficult to say. So at any rate, incredible build or fast build are kind of great for speeding up uh, compilation. And they are incremental, meaning they don't try to rebuild the world if you've already got part of it built, which, which is also very useful. And in some cases, actually people argue that it might not uh, make that much sense to uh, uh, use all these tools. Because the thing is, after you've built your project once, and let's say it's a massive project, you're not going to be rebuilding every tiny thing again. The only situation where you're going to be rebuilding a massive project is when you change something at the root of the dependency tree. That's when you need a, a total rebuild. But uh, quite frankly, like when I get a new version of Boost, I, I built it in RAM. I literally, I make a RAM disk of about like 20 something gigabytes. I copy it there and I build it there. And even then it's not instant, it takes a few minutes, but uh, that's how painful it can get sometimes. So suddenly having a distributed system is, uh, is a great thing. All right, so let me show you another uh, major uh, to which which I use, which is the Intel Parallel Studio. So let me uh, let me show you the the website first of all and describe what this is. Uh, so 
in the modern world, we have uh, two, well, I'd say two major CPU manufacturers, even though Intel is kind of, uh, uh, kind of dominating, and it's actually it's not it's not the fault of Intel that that you know it's evil and dominating. It's actually the result of the fact that the AMD CPUs are, uh, let's be honest, not as great. And I've certainly had my share of uh, AMD CPUs that I wasn't personally happy with. So uh, the end result is that in addition to making CPUs, Intel also makes a C++ compiler, but it's not just the compiler, it's actually like a whole development stack, if you will, because, uh, the, so yes, you do get the, the Intel C++ compiler, but you also get uh, lots of libraries. So, and these libraries, uh, there's a, there was actually a bit of a scandal at some point, because essentially those libraries are optimized for Intel CPUs. So they, they vectorize, they parallelize, and they are attuned to uh, the, the Intel CPUs, not to mention the exotic stuff like the Xeon FICO processors. But uh, the problem was that, uh, you know, Intel shipped some libraries which were Intel specific and uh, AMD shipped some AMD specific libraries. And the sad thing was that uh, well, one of the sad things was that the Intel libraries were actually faster on AMD than AMD's own libraries. But uh, one thing that Intel did is uh, they uh, added a kind of um, uh, a very unfriendly switch to uh, the compiled binary so that when it detects a non-Intel CPU, it would just turn off all the optimizations. And then, of course, some people came out and they actually said, oh, hey, we, we can see what you're doing here. Here is a fix. We're going to give people a fix so that those optimizations are re-enabled. But whatever the case, I think that most of us in the, in this webinar, for example, are probably using Intel CPU. So it's, uh, uh, it's, a, uh, it's certainly a vendor-specific solution. However, there is one interesting uh, thing about the, the Intel C++ compiler specifically, and that is it's one of those compilers which at the moment is available on all platforms, meaning Windows, OS X, and Linux. Now, I know that you can you can technically argue that you know something like GCC is also available everywhere, or Clang is also available everywhere, but that's not exactly true in the sense that the kind of experience, for example, like with GCC or Clang, the kind of experience you get on Windows is somewhat different. Whereas with the Intel compiler, uh, you essentially get a uniform experience, meaning you you basically get all the same bugs, and I know it sounds a bit uh, depressing, but at least you can you can expect those bugs in a uniform manner on Linux and and Windows and OS X as well. Whereas uh, with the other situations, and certainly with cross compiling with different compilers, the results are kind of unpredictable. So that's one of the reasons why I like the uh, the Intel compiler. So in addition to the compiler itself, you also get plenty of uh, libraries. So you get uh, well, actually, let's let's actually jump in. I, I'm going to briefly show you how the whole thing works, essentially, because uh, what happens is that Intel Parallel Studio integrates with Visual Studio. So it's one of those big major plugins which integrate into Visual Studio. And you can take an existing C++ project like this one, for example. At the moment, it's using the Microsoft Visual C++ compiler, which is a good compiler and no complaints against it. It's It's got plenty of features. But you can go into Intel compiler and you can actually use the Intel uh, tool set instead, in which case, you know, it's just a straightforward conversion. And now you've got Intel C++ to the right of your project. So it doesn't doesn't rewrite any code or anything. What it does do is it changes the settings. So the project settings. Let me show you the, uh, the actual settings page. So essentially, in addition to the uh, Microsoft stuff that we had, we now have some Intel related stuff. And one of those things is uh, the kind of implicit or uh, project defined integration of the Intel libraries. So there are three libraries which are, well, four in this case, the four libraries which are kind of major and which I would say are worth using. So let's let's discuss those. So first of all, there is the Intel threading building blocks. Now it's actually an interesting story because uh, Microsoft and Intel, they both provide their own uh, imperative parallelization libraries. So in the case of uh, both the Microsoft uh, Parallel Patterns Library and the Intel Threading Building Blocks, they provide certain constructs like parallel for each, for example, for parallelization. Uh, however, 
the difference is that the Intel uh, threading building box provide uh, more stuff. They also provide a few collections and other interesting things like that. But on the basic level, they, their APIs are actually identical which is surprising. When do you see that sort of identical APIs in, into vendor uh, related libraries? Although the, of, obviously the difference is that you get the Microsoft parallel patterns library for free, whereas the Intel threading building blocks, just like the rest of the Intel uh, parallel studio is actually a commercial product that you have to pay actual money for. I'm sorry, but <laughs> uh, I, I am talking about uh, fairly commercial things here. So this is one of the libraries. The other library is the integrated performance primitives. I'm not so familiar with it, but essentially it's a library uh, which contains um, uh, support for, from what I remember, various audio and video codecs and sort of optimizations in this regard. I don't use it much, to be honest. Next up is the uh, map kernel library, which is a uh, math library uh, that is optimized for, you know, Intel vectorization, basically. So the, the kind of SIMD that uh, Intel CPUs do. And I don't know how it behaves with, uh, uh, with the AMD. Certainly, if we're talking about AVX, I think it should be more or less uniform. But if we're talking before AVX, then there is really no way to tell. And, and certainly that's, that's one of the issues where people noticed that Intel was basically disabling uh, all this, this uh, optimizations for the AMD CPUs when compiled using the Intel compiler. So the math kernel library is actually uh, very popular for, not, not necessarily for end users because it does have quite an evil interface, I would say, like if you want to multiply two matrices, for example, uh, you're going to be passing lots of pointers and nasty stuff around. It's not pretty. However, uh, what uh, what you typically find is that like computer algebra systems, for example, they can use Intel math kernel library. So this is basically kind of like a stamp of approval. Something like MATLAB uses MKL, that means it's, it's good, right? So this is the third library. And uh, I also wanted to mention MPI as well. So there is an edition of uh, the Intel Parallel Studio that the largest edition is called uh, the Cluster Edition, Cluster XE. So this supports, um, uh, this supports uh, kind of uh, heterogeneous computing along machine clusters, and that's what the MPI library is for. And in actual fact, there are different implementations of MPI. Microsoft has an implementation. There is also the the MPI Chameleon library, and then there is the Intel implementation as well. So this essentially means that Intel also provides you a service which can run uh, on each of the machines as part of your cluster, which actually uh, you can send work to that service and then get the data back. So um, I actually, uh, if you uh, check out the high performance computing course on Pluralsight, I have a module there on MPI. So, so if you're interested in that, check it out. MPI is uh, an old, ancient, it's an arcane interface, but it's an interface which is probably the number one interface for uh, cluster computing uh, use, if you're using C++. And you will be using C++ for any kind of high performance computing, I imagine. So uh, it's it's the number one API. It's certainly not the most modern. Interestingly enough, there is also a boost wrapper around the M M MPI, which makes it a lot easier to use because you get wonderful benefits like boost serialization and whatever. Uh, so uh, these are the settings related to the library. So once you enable one of these, you can you can sort of uh, double click it and include the header, and that's it. And and some of these are quite customizable. Like for example, if we look at the use of the math library, you'll see that uh, you can actually, you can, uh, you can do it sequential, like single threaded, you can do it parallel, in which case the math library will also parallelize. So we'll use multi-threading and then there is a cluster solution as well. So if you want to run your fast Fourier transform along a cluster using MPI, then the library, the math kernel library already has implementations for that. So you don't have to implement your own thing. You just call a function, you know, so call, call some FFT function, it will, it will do it automatically, which is great. So, so in this case, uh, I got to take off my hat to Intel because they made the whole thing very convenient and very kind of uh, tempting to use. And then, of course, there is the optimization part. So uh, optimization is something that is... Um, uh, the trump card of the Intel C++ compiler because, well, they own the process, as you see, so they <laughs> who better uh, to tell us how to optimize for a particular processor? And the end result is that you get specific optimization uh, constructs which use 
literally rocket science kind of technology, like for example, into procedural optimization, you know, uh, the, well, automatic parallelization as well. And, you know, it even provides some Intel optimized headers so you can get your, uh, you can get some, some extra performance by not using the uh, the header that uh, comes with uh, Visual Studio, but using this kind of header. The parallelization option, what it does is if it basically, if you've got like a loop which can be parallelized, then it just goes off and it uses OpenMP. So essentially behind the covers, it actually uses, you know, the OpenMP thread pool and everything, which is great once again. And it's uh, uh, the only the only thing I have to warn you about is if you try to read the assembly language that's actually behind what's being generated, then you're going to find it really difficult to read because the, as I said, because it's, it's rocket science, it's really uh, sophisticated stuff. Now, uh, some of the uh, let's say some of the negative parts about uh, the Intel compiler. So first of all, bugs, right? So I have uh, uh, I have not encountered as many bugs in any C++ compiler as I've seen in the Intel compiler. Uh, unfortunately, some of those bugs are quite insane. Like for example, you write something that's tiny and perfectly valid and you get just an error code. Nobody tells you anything and you basically have to contact Intel and tell them, by the way, here's an example. And they say, oh yes, yes, uh, we are aware of this and you're going to get it in the next update. So then if you're re critically relying on this feature, you just have to wait for an update. And luckily we're getting updates more and more frequently recently. I think uh, once every two or three months relatively, I think, but still, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit painful, but you know, if you want to be on the cutting edge, then, then this is, uh, this is the uh, stuff to go for. Once again, if you want the, well, I'm saying cutting edge in the sense of uh, Intel CPU support. I'm not saying cutting edge in the sense of getting C++14 uh, support, for example, because uh, Intel is not leading the pack in this regard. So if you uh, if you want your you know automatic return type deduction, then uh, you might have to wait for it just like everything else. But on the other hand, you do get some exciting options like uh, uh, C, uh, well, I think it's, uh, it's actually, no, this isn't the setting, but essentially, uh, there is another technology uh, called the Intel Xeon Fi, and I cannot stop talking about it. So I'm going to uh, use this uh, uh, use this the webinar as an additional excuse to mention the uh, Xeon Fi simply because it is uh, it's something new. You know, the we we do have a bit of a problem that CPUs are not getting drastically faster, and uh, you you know the free lunch is over basically. But on the other hand, at least Intel is trying something. So the Xeon Fi is a coprocessor. It's basically like a computer to put inside your computer. And the end result is that you get an additional 60 cores or roughly 60 cores. They're not the fastest cores in the world, okay? So they're like Pentium 4 class cores, but there's 60 of them and they have a 512 bit vector and they also have uh, you know, full way hub hardware parallelization in there. So you, you basically, you get lots of threads and you get a big vector, which once again, for certain calculations is great, but it's also great because you don't get any of that branch divergence stuff that you get with uh, GPUs. So, uh, that, and why am I mentioning it? Well, because to compile for these babies, now they, they are x86 compatible-ish, but if you want your programs to run on them, then you have to use the Intel compiler. There's no way around it, unfortunately. Yeah, I'm sorry, but this is uh, this is how things are set up. So once again, you would need the, the Intel compiler. Although having said that, the I, I'm on Windows here and Windows isn't the best platform to be running these babies, but uh, still, you know, it's it's a it's a possibility. And certainly uh, what the Intel compiler does, among other things, is it kind of, it when, when you say, uh, for example, please vectorize my code, and not, not to mention the fact that there's lots of, uh, you know, pragmas and things that uh, the compiler supports for vectorization, but it also kind of targets the you can specify which architecture you want to target. And there is very fine control in uh, what, what you actually want to support. And this is great because you know you can specify that you want, if, if I'm doing this on this particular machine, I'm just gonna say, can you please optimize for the host? Whereas if I know that I'm doing it for some other server, I can specify what, uh, what the highest level of, uh, uh, simmed I want in this regard and and in in this case you know I'm not going to get any program crashes if I try to write uh, if I try to run you know SSE version 4 on an SSE version 3 CPU because it's all taken care of automatically so um 
in addition to uh, the uh, the compiler and the libraries, there's also lots of profiling. I mean, literally tons. Uh, so uh, the most popular uh, profiler is the VTune uh, profiler. This basically, uh, well, I'm I probably shouldn't run this because my my example is kind of trivial. But essentially, what one of the goals of this whole thing is to figure out. Uh, whether you're using the CPU efficiently, meaning whether you're parallelizing the code uh, as well as you could be. And if, you, if you're not, then, then this thing basically, it tells you about it. Although in, in, in my case, you know, I have a hello world program here basically, so it's not going to, uh, well, oh look, we, we have the demo effect, even worse than that. I thought I would, you know, at least do something. Do I have a, uh, okay. I, I'm not going to uh, delve into uh, in, into this example, but if if you take like more serious projects and, and you run on it, you you're going to see nice graphs and everything. So it is a good profiler for C++. Um, uh, seeing how we just uh, have you know a quarter of an hour left, I, th there are a couple of things that I want to mention which are kind of all over the place. So out of the major like really big extensions to uh, Visual Studio. I would say Incredible is one. Then there is the Intel Parallel Studio. Certainly, uh, ReShopper and uh, you know the uh, the other tools that we make are major extensions. And then there is the CUDA toolkit, which I've kind of neglected because CUDA is essentially its own platform. It's no longer you know standard C++ or standard C Sharp. It's its own thing, and it's also very powerful because it employs a client-server architecture. And we uh, at some point. Uh, we might do uh, a maybe a webinar on uh, CUDA specifically. I also have a plural site course on CUDA if you're interested. Uh, so CUDA is another one of those really like huge extensions uh, to Visual Studio. And then of course there are other ways of building extensions. And uh, recently I've been delving into the past because I've I've been uh, involved with uh, Visual Studio extensions in one way or another for a long time. So here is something. Uh, let me uh, try to dig that up, something really arcane that I found. So uh, for those of you who are uh, maybe not sure what's going on here, uh, there used to be, and, and I think there still is, a technology stack within Visual Studio called DSL Tools. And it used to be called DSL Tools, it's now called the Visualization and Modeling SDK. And uh, essentially what this is, is a way of defining languages or defining visual languages visually, which is, I know it sounds extremely confusing, but let me try to explain what's going on here. So let's suppose that uh, you are making a, uh, uh, you want to make some sort of flowchart editor, like a visual flowchart editor, kind of like Microsoft Visio or that sort of thing. What you can do, and, and this is a Visual Studio technology, not something inside Microsoft Office. What you can do is you can essentially define both your domain models. So you define the classes and the relationships which model your flowchart. And you also make the diagram elements. And in the end result, you end up with an editor, a kind of a visual editor. By the way, this, uh, this what you're looking at right now is also defined using this, this kind of paradigm. So essentially, uh, what you could do in, uh, uh, in with DSL tools, and I think you still can. Unfortunately, this technology, it's actually, it's very sad because this technology uh, did not uh, get popularized enough simply because it's difficult. It's really difficult to get to grips with the paradigm. But if you if you master it, what you end up being able to do is you define your diagram. So you have your little boxes and you can drag them around. And then, uh, what you could do is you could write T4 scripts that would take uh, your diagram, because after all, your diagram is just a chunk of XML, basically. That's that's what it is. You could take a diagram, and then you can generate code from it. So uh, in in one way, it it sounds like this, you know, we have this ideal of having UML, where you, you make a... Uh, you make your model visually, and then you generate code. And of course, we all know that that failed with a bang. It, I mean, totally failed because you know the whole round trip engineering thing did not work, and we we no longer talk about UML that much, unless you work in a in a really big enterprise which prefers bureaucracy instead of actually building products. But uh, it's still it's still available. This technology. I mean, I had to. Uh, open up Visual Studio 2008 for for this because that's when I wrote the 
the implementation. In this case, I tried to get the uh, get the visual part to generate a pulse and weight kind of uh, parallelization mechanic, but it's still you know it's still usable. The only problem is that it's very obscure. But the end result is you effectively get your own new language in Visual Studio. The only catch is it's not a text language. It's not a textual language. Instead, it's a visual language, and you can uh, you can drag boxes around and you know drag the, the little arrows between them, and it all feels a bit like Visio, I guess. So, but you know this this is one of the older and and maybe still relevant for some people. I think there there is there are still fans of this approach who, uh, especially in France, for some reason, I have no idea why, but France seems to be like the the place for DSL tools. It's now called Visualization and Modeling SDK, and I think you can uh, find it uh, in the uh, in the extension manager, or maybe not. I'm I'm not sure, but I I think I got it from from the the MSDN subscription actually. So uh, these are uh, certainly not an exhaustive list of how you can build extensions because certainly the, the new models of uh, uh, VS extensibility in 2013, 2015 versions of Visual Studio, they, they make it really easy to make those adorners and things. So that, that's really, uh, you know, think, things are uh, evolving and improving somewhat. And the last thing I want to mention is, which in my mind is kind of like the, the maturity indicator of an extension is when your extension has extensions. So if for some reason uh, you are a reshopper user, uh, then uh, you will find, oh, got, gone to the wrong menu, hold on. You will find that your extensions can have extensions, which is, you know, kind of, um, uh, on the one hand, it's creepy. On the other hand, some of, some of the extensions that we have in the extension manager are really valid and, and they're really uh, fun stuff. Like, uh, of course, uh, many of these extensions are kind of micro features, but some of them are fairly serious. Like, for example, spell checking. So you you install this and reshop a spell checks uh, your code, and and you know you can add stuff to a dictionary and whatever. And uh, this uh, this just goes to show that you know there is no. Uh, it it feels like what what is that film where you know. Inception, yeah, multiple layers of reality. It's the same thing here. Like you have Visual Studio, you have an extension within Visual Studio, and I'm pretty sure that you can have, uh, you can provide support for extensions within extensions as well. Although that that's kind of maybe going a bit too far. So um, uh, I think I I'm going to uh, stop at this point. Hopefully, I've been able to demonstrate, you know, some of the ways in which Visual Studio can be extended. Obviously, I haven't covered. I mean, there's like gazillions of uh, uh, gazillions of uh, things in the, in there. Uh, so uh, let me just go through the questions. There, there aren't that many. So uh, the first question is uh, curious what uh, Git add-ins or extensions I would use or recommend. To be honest, I just use uh, Tortoise Git. I don't delve in Visual Studio too much. Although, I mean, it, if, if Visual Studio's own Git support uh, works for you, then that's great. However, if you start fiddling with uh, the root of your uh, Git repository, then Visual Studio very quickly goes uh, a bit uh, mental. I think that for most people, uh, the best solution uh, is, uh, well, the, there is the GitHub application. I know it's it, it sounds a bit funny, like suggesting the, the GitHub app because, um, because it's very simplistic and because it also goes crazy if you do something non-standard. But I think for, for most people who would just push and pull and not do anything sophisticated like rebases and other crazy stuff, it's it's perfectly fine. I use Tortoise Git. It, it allows for a bit of control. And uh, the second comment regarding the LinSpace function, I actually copied this from the web uh, just before this uh, this demonstration. So yeah, it might not be ideal. Sorry about that. Uh, but uh, you know, <laughs> uh, I, I just, I mean, th there is a LinSpace function in MATLAB, so I, I just wrote LinSpace C++ and, and that's it. So if you, if you feel free to suggest a fix, but I think for, for this little demo, it's not so important. All right, so uh, I want to thank everyone for attending this webinar and uh, uh, feel free to send me comments. Let me, let me leave my, uh, credentials here. So DN at jetbrains.com and Dean Esther on Twitter. So if you have any questions about, well, obviously, uh, mainly about the, the reshopper and other ecosystem stuff that we provide, but also if you're curious about uh, some of the other things I've shown, then feel free to uh, drop me a line and uh, 
uh, you know. Okay, so one last question. Uh, one last question here is how how do our products relate to uh, the extensions that I've shown here today? Uh, actually, good uh, good question. Uh, so uh, in most cases, uh, the answer is that they're kind of ambivalent. But uh, in the case of, for example, the the Intel support of C++, we also support the the Intel variety of C++. It's not a problem for us. So Reshaper C++ works with it just fine. For the most part, we don't conflict with the certainly the extensions I've shown today. We don't conflict with in any way. But there are extensions. I mean, if you look at the the major extensions like Visual Assist or Code Rush, those extensions we would Reshaper would have a problem with. So that would be the uh, that would be an, an obvious issue because they're trying to do essentially the same things like like color uh, color the code and do underlinings and do pop-ups so it can get really nasty and and there are also actually the, there are some conventional extensions like you know the productivity power tools for example I, I don't actually know if it's still a thing in 2015 but it used to be the case that we were incompatible uh, with it essentially so I have. I have carefully avoided going over our own products, but hopefully I've given you a taste of uh, the universe out there. What are other people doing from, and, and certainly one last thing I want to mention is I want to encourage you to, first of all, make these tiny extensions because some of them are really useful. Like for example, this thing with hiding the toolbar, it might seem like trivial, but it if you have a small laptop, it really, really saves space and it, it helps a lot of people and and the other thing i i want to uh, maybe encourage you to do is if you're making something like this then then you know consider turning it into a product and selling it because people are doing it and people are making money even off reshop of plugins not to mention the visual studio plugins so uh feel, feel free to experiment there there is sufficient demand uh for this kind of thing and especially if you make something really useful so with that in mind, I want to thank you for uh, checking out this webinar and wish you all the best of luck in uh, in trying out these Visual Studio extensions and, you know, uh, let us all know how it goes for you. So that's it. Thanks a lot and bye-bye.